My sister had an experience as a child that I think I should share with you. I was also there when it happened, but it's my sister who's been affected the most negatively by it. It wasn't as if though we could have seen it coming. Our hometown is small, no more than 20,000 today, and it was probably less back then. We grew up in a very religious house where the Bible was read every evening and church was attended twice a week. And despite no longer being part of the church, I enjoyed those days. Everyone was kind and loving, and it was like having a giant family. Looking back, our home life appears to have been a normal Midwestern one. Martina, my sister, and I never went without anything. Neither of us ever felt unloved or lacked support when we needed it. I'd almost go as far as saying that we had perfect parents, or at least as perfect as any could be. We still have a very close relationship, and I don't hesitate to go to them whenever I need help with my own kids. In short, I considered myself very fortunate to have them as parents, and I aspire to be just as half as good as they were with us. As great as our folks were, they couldn't watch over us 24 hours a day. They had to work, and we had to go to school. Since first grade, Martina and I both had gone to a Christian private school in our city. Like most regular schools, we had a recess period. Ours happened to be after lunch, and it was during one of these times when some stranger decided to make his appearance. I was 12 that year and Martina was 9. Since the school was small, all the grades took their recess at the same time. I'm just like any other big sister. I've always been protective of Martina. Even when she was off playing with her friends, I made sure to check on her every once in a while. On this day, I was talking to another girl my age when she brought something to my attention. I looked over and saw Martina talking to a man by the fence. Since I didn't recognize him, I got kind of nervous. This was the 90s, mind you. All of us kids were getting that stranger danger talk drilled into our heads constantly. Unfortunately, Martina had always been friendly to anyone who was nice to her. In a perfect world, her innocence would have been sweet, but our world is far from perfect. I ran over to our teacher and told her what was going on. She decided to run toward the fence and I followed closely behind. The man seemingly fled as soon as he saw us coming. Martina was crying when we reached her. The poor girl didn't understand why we'd driven her friend away and I tried to explain it to her before but she was just too naive and kind-hearted. I stuck to Martina like glue after that. She and I would eat lunch together and I would stand near her during recess. She didn't like it one bit but I didn't care. And for a while, her safety was all I thought about and I kind of became so obsessed that I had nightmares of her being abducted. It was far too much pressure for someone so young to take on, but the fear of losing my sister drove me mad. My parents were naturally concerned and did all they could to explain the dangers, but stopped when she looked like she was about to cry. And now that I'm a parent myself, I understand why. There's a fine line between teaching your kids an important lesson and destroying their innocence. Even at 12, I knew the dangers strangers posed despite not yet understanding what sick things they actually had planned. The mere thought of never seeing my family again was enough to keep me safe. Up until that incident, we had always walked to and from school, but had to ride the bus after. This made the school day so much longer, and I quickly grew to hate it. The school took the dangers seriously and hired a second safety officer to patrol the campus during recess, all the necessary measures seemed to work, and several months passed, and it was looking like the man had moved on. Eventually, the alert level was lowered back to normal and everyone got back to their regular lives, even the second officer would be let go. We all thought that we'd be able to return to our old lives. From all appearances, the creepy man had given up. This wasn't the case, though. He'd taken a liking to Martina. All he had to do was be patient and wait. We let our defenses down one day, and when that day came, he would strike. And that day did come, about nine months later, and it wasn't where we expected. It had almost been a year since the incident at the school. Most of us had returned to our old habits. I had begun letting Martina out of my sight during recess, as had the teachers. The one remaining safety officer spent most of his time smoking in his car. It's safe to say no one was prepared for what had come next. It was a Saturday afternoon, the first truly nice and warm weekend of the year. Martina and I were at the park with our mom and some friends, and 
I had been pushing Martino on a swing just a few minutes prior and was now getting a drink from the water fountain. I guess she was alone when he snatched her. I was alerted by her screaming and turned to see the same stranger running away with her in his arms. I immediately took after this man screaming for my mother frantically as I went. She and a few of the other mothers were just ahead of me, also chasing after him. It looked like he was going to get away, but just a few yards from the car, he stopped and put Martina down. He had this weird, sour look on his face and was patting his shirt, I remember seeing that. He was about to pick her back up, but noticed my mom was getting close. He hesitated for a moment before turning and running for his car again, and amazingly, he had left Martina behind. He made it to his car and sped away, but not before my mom and a few others got his plate number. When we finally reached Martina, we saw why the dirtbag had put her down. The poor girl was so terrified that she had wet herself. I can't imagine the fear that she must have felt. Mom scooped her up and held her suffocatingly close, and we all cried her eyes out and it was equal parts relief and absolute heartbreak. The effects of the trauma showed up almost immediately. When the police questioned her, Martina wouldn't answer. She remained this way for several months. This once vibrant and talkative little girl was now almost catatonic. No matter who spoke to her, she wouldn't answer. A distant and empty gaze stayed fixed on her face, and Mom became inconsolable and I was at a loss at what to do and the only bright spot was that we had the man's plate number, and while we waited for updates, Mom did all she could to get Martina to talk. She'd see a long series of counselors and psychiatrists, but not much was achieved, and she would eventually speak again, but there was no going back from that. The blind trust that she had once had was completely destroyed, and much of her life after that was spent alone in her room, the only place that she felt completely safe. She rarely dated anyone, and if she did, it was boys that she had known for quite a long time. And against all the odds, she did eventually find somebody, but the relationship is constantly being tested by these issues and traumas of her past. Once word had reached us that the stranger had actually been caught, our dad volunteered to deal with the investigation from there on. All I know is that he did go to prison, but I'm not sure for how long or where he is now. And should he be stupid enough to show his face here again, it will not end well for him. I started taking evening walks around campus in my final year of college. It wasn't long before I began noticing that it helped me keep my weight down and clear my head after a long day of work. After graduation, I kept up the practice and continued doing it to this day. While many of those around me had become diabetic and hypertensive, causing them to become dependent on multiple medications, I have none of those problems. In fact, my blood pressure is consistently well within the normal range, just as my weight and blood sugar are, and at present, I'm the only member of my family able to make such a claim, actually. As I approach my 43rd birthday, I see no reason to ever stop those post-dinner walks. For anyone reading this interested in getting healthier, I recommend walking over jogging every time. You get all the benefits without the wear and tear on your body that you often get from running. Knee problems come to mind specifically. Anyways, like everything in life, there will always be a few downsides to any activity though. Most of those will come from the outside world and those things that you just can't control. The story I'm telling today involves one such downside. The setting was a nice, cool summer evening. I had just completed a wonderful dinner with my family and set out for my usual four-mile trek around my neighborhood. I'd made this walk a thousand times and never encountered anything worse than a dog who'd escaped from its owner. In those cases, it only took a shoe or a wave with my walking stick to drive them away. These walks, being one of the rare times in my life I got to myself, I'd use it to plan out my future or just enjoy the beautiful music of nature going on all around me. For this reason, I generally walked alone. Although I never stopped anyone from coming along, I think my family realized that I preferred the solitude. On this night, the sun was just beginning to dip below the horizon. I was coming up to the midway point where I turned for home. 
My street comes to a dead end exactly two miles from my house. At that dead end, there's a big oak tree that I walk around. I have no particular reason to do it, it just became a habit after a while. Anyway, I just made my turn and was heading back when a man's voice boomed out from behind me. Good evening, neighbor. I almost jumped out of my skin when I heard it. I looked over my shoulder and saw a man jogging up to me. I was so annoyed that I actually barked a curse at him. He seemed to come out of nowhere. There was a bunch of trees off to the left, but I didn't see or hear anyone over there when I passed by. Something about it just didn't seem right, though. It was getting dark, but from what I could tell, I'd never seen the man before and I had no interest in making friends at that moment, especially this guy. His popping up from behind me had me in a bad mood. I'm not usually a rude person, but something about him bothered me and it went beyond his sneaky arrival. I attempted to just lose him, but he actually eventually caught up. Now I was sure that I didn't know him. It's unseasonably cold for this time of the year, isn't it? His attempt at small talk kind of grated on me, and I could feel the scowl on my face. All I wanted at that moment was just to get home. I fought the urge to tell him to just buzz off. I didn't want to be rude. Despite being clueless, he'd done nothing wrong, really. We walked another mile or so together before my house showed up, and this entire time he'd continued rambling on about nothing important, and I didn't really say anything back. The relief that I felt seeing my house in the distance was quickly replaced by this sense of dread. I wasn't sure if I wanted this annoying man to know where I lived. Instead of turning onto my street, I just kept walking. I had no plan of how I was going to shake the guy, but I figured that I'd come up with it as I walked. We carried on for about 20 yards or so before he said something that just made my blood run cold. Hey, Nick, isn't that your street we just passed? This sort of sick feeling washed over me, and I actually felt like I broke out into a cold sweat. I took another step and everything just kind of went silent. An indescribable rage boiled inside of me. I could hear my heart pounding inside my head. And finally I blew up on the man in a way I'd never had before on anyone. I screamed at him. Who in the hell are you? I'd never met you before in my life and how do you know my name? I know I didn't tell it to you, I said. A smug smile seemed to kind of spread across his face, and it was just beyond spine-chilling in that moment. Well, it looks like you got me. He was already this rather imposing gentleman, but that smile made him just monstrous in my eyes. An air of menace poured off of him like cheap cologne, and I grew more nervous the longer I stood there, but despite the terror that I felt, my ego prodded me to just assert myself there. To some onlooker, it might have been like seeing a sardine trying to intimidate a great white. I don't know who in the hell you think you are or why you decided to bother me, but I can promise you that if you ever bother me again, I'll shove my foot so far up your you-know-what. You'll need a surgeon to remove it. I actually said that. It was laughable, and it was an empty threat. I'm an average-sized man, but he could have bent me into a pretzel if he really wanted to. By this point, I was so scared and angry that it was shaking uncontrollably. I'm sure that he could see it and it probably went a long way assuring him that he had the upper hand. Even after all of my sort of threats and yelling, that weird grin that he had never seemed to fade. There was another long, uncomfortable silence. I was almost relieved when that guy finally spoke. Have a nice night, Nick. I was at a loss at how to react. So I just turned and began walking toward home. Every few yards or so I'd look over my shoulder to ensure that he wasn't following. Each time I half expected him to pop up right behind me and strangle me to death with his massive hands. I kept this up until I got inside my house. And now that I was, you know, quote unquote safe, the fear overwhelmed me so much that I had to run to the bathroom and I legitimately vomited. I'd never done that before. But once I heaved up my entire dinner, I rinsed out my mouth and washed my face in the sink. And I kind of stared at myself in the reflection, wondering why I'd reacted so negatively to that guy. Never in my life have I ever had an experience like this, nor can I fully explain what had happened. All I know is that every cell in my body told me to just get away. 
His very presence just felt wrong for some unexplainable reason, and this made me hate him. Had he not acted so strange when I confronted him, I may still be questioning my behavior. Now I know I'm not explaining it very well, and most of you probably reading this probably think I'm crazy, but I can only describe how I felt at that moment. I briefly thought about calling the police, but I had no idea what I would even say if I did. Making small talk with a neighbor is hardly a crime, and if anyone acted suspiciously, it was me. Threatening to assault a stranger didn't sound like a sane reaction to the situation. I chose to keep my mouth shut and say nothing, and that includes to my wife. There was no way she'd even understand, and I don't really blame her. After that incident, I began carrying my handgun with me in the evenings and changed the route that I took. Fortunately, I would never have another experience like that again, but... I would see that man one more time. It had been five or six months since he and I had spoken. I was doing a good job putting the incident behind me. One afternoon, my wife and I were unloading groceries from the car and a silver four-door sedan slowly drove by. The driver waved at us, and being the friendly neighbor that I usually am, I waved back. I barely lowered my hand when I realized that the driver was that same stranger. All those awful feelings came flooding back. That horrible smile burned into my mind, and I'm not sure how long I was really standing there, and my wife's voice pulled me back to earth. She asked if I was okay and said that I was white as a sheet. Rather than dredge up the whole story and risk looking like some insane person, I told her that I was probably just dehydrated. She accepted the excuse, and we went back to unloading the car. Five years have gone by, and I haven't seen this guy since. Even though I've had all this time to think about it, I still have no idea why he and I crossed paths that day. He obviously sought me out, but that's all I can be certain of. I've had some minor disagreements with a few neighbors, but nothing that I could think justified hiring someone to intimidate or even stalk me. He never gave me a message or threatened me like you'd think a person like that would. Unless he shows up again or someone brings it up, I can only conclude that he chose me at random to just bully. And now that I've finally told people about what happened, I intend to make this the last time that I talk about it. Hopefully, sharing it here will allow me to let it go once and for all, and it can be forgotten about forever. This happened during the holidays of 2011-2012. I had just turned 18 the previous spring and my mom and sisters and I were traveling from Canada to visit family friends and spend Christmas and New Year's soaking up the sun and relaxing on the incredibly gorgeous Seven Mile Beach. During the day I'd spend a lot of time with my family doing excursions, swimming with dolphins, snorkeling, paragliding and enjoying the hot sun, a far cry from the brutal winter we escaped from. At night I was mostly left to myself to find my own fun. My sisters were underage so they couldn't go out drinking with me. I spent a lot of time wandering around the beach, going for late night walks and trying to meet other kids my age. It actually worked out pretty well and I met some cool people. I hung out with a brother and sister from Toronto and met a 30 year old woman who had stumbled away from her work party and thought that I was much older than I was. As an 18 year old I had sort of this fake confidence where I'd outwardly presented myself as someone who seemed like they knew exactly what they wanted. Excellent at talking to girls, brave, and even cocky, but inside I definitely couldn't back that up. I was shy and nervous and really had to force myself to talk to strangers. It was tough, but a bit of liquid courage made my conversations flow far more naturally, though the constant anxiety, especially when it came to girls, never really went away. I just pretended it wasn't there. One night I stumbled across a group of Americans, Jess, Amber, and Alyssa, and her boyfriend Caleb, as well as a local guy named Ernest smoking some weed on the beach. They were all around 20 years old and they invited me to join them. We spent a few hours getting to know each other and telling stupid stories. I had a bottle of rum, they had weed, so for a group of dumb kids, it was a match made in heaven. It was getting late, so we all made plans to meet up the next night and do some bar hopping. The next night came, and I met them at the resort. We go to this bar that Ernest suggests. It was a sports bar with beer pong tables, pool, and other games like Buck Hunter and Pinball. 
It was attached to a nightclub that had a dubstep Friday event that we planned to hit up after a few drinks. We start drinking at the sports bar and I met all kinds of interesting people including a girl from my hometown who went to school just down the street from my house. It was really a blast and I can't remember having more fun at a bar in my entire life at that point. Usually when you go out to a bar, you hang out with your friends and maybe meet the odd person here and there, but this was different. It was refreshing getting to meet so many people from all over the place. After getting demolished by a couple in their 60s at beer pong, we began mingling with another group of kids our age, and there was this one girl, I'll just call her Amanda, who basically became attached to my hip upon meeting and extremely touchy towards me. Even though I was uncomfortable with this complete stranger, I just sort of played it off. I didn't want to be rude, and I wasn't interested in her advances. Not only was she not giving me my personal space, but I just simply wasn't attracted to her. I kind of had the hots for the aforementioned Amber, and I wasn't about to let this girl get in the way of that. I was a bit short with her, but still friendly enough to not upset her, and some of the other people in her group were pretty cool, so I just sort of let it slide. Our group of six had basically doubled in size, so it was at this point we all decided to go to the nightclub. We get to the bar top and start ordering drinks and trying to be the cool guy that I thought I was. I order a round for the whole group. Everyone was pretty pumped and I felt good. I passed Amanda her drink and she squeezed my butt and gave me this sort of wink. I basically ignored it and downed my drink with the rest of the group. A good 20 minutes pass and I'm having a good time dancing, drinking, and chatting with the Americans that I met the previous day when Amanda stumbles over to me and starts touching me again. Hey cutie, she says. How about you come dance with me? Uh, no thanks, I'm okay. I feel so messed up, she responds. Come on, it'll be fun. I I'm really alright, I'm just gonna hang out with these guys. She looks dejected and... Then she does a total 180 on me that completely catches me off guard. You know, I'm pretty messed up. Did you put something in my drink? Uh, what are you talking about? I reply. You definitely put something in my drink, didn't you? I only had a few and I feel so messed up. Uh, that's ridiculous. I proclaimed. Why would I ever do something like that? No, you definitely put something in my drink, and I'm, I'm going to tell everyone here that you're trying to drug me. I was totally stunned. I didn't even know this chick, and I didn't even know what to say. I know stuff like this happens to people, and you should especially be careful around strangers, but I most certainly did not put anything in this person's drink. At first, I was a bit concerned. Maybe someone else did. The fact that she was using this to threaten me convinced me otherwise. I swear I didn't put anything in your drink. I, I, he didn't put anything in your drink. Amber chimed in. I hardly even know this guy, but I can tell you he didn't put anything in your drink. How do you know that? Amanda responded. Maybe he put something in your drink too. I feel fine. Do you all feel fine? She asked her group to a resounding yes. Leave us alone and find someone else to harass. Amanda smiled and winked at me and walked away. That was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen, said Amber. You just stick with us. We got your back if she comes around again. I spent the rest of the night incredibly anxious with my head on a swivel. She was there with her friends and I would occasionally catch her staring daggers at me, scowling. It made it really hard to enjoy the rest of the evening. As the bar was closing, I went outside to smoke a cigarette and wait for the others when Amanda came up to me again. Hey, I'm sorry for accusing you of putting something in my drink. Do you want to come down to the beach with me? We can get some alone time and I can give you a proper apology. Alarm bells went off in my head. What was this girl trying to do? She accused me of drugging her and now she's asking me to be alone with her? Was this some sadistic way of flirting with me? Absolutely not, I said in the most stern voice possible. This is insane. Just leave me alone, man. I didn't even let her respond. I threw down my half-finished cigarette and ran back into the bar to find the others and tell them what happened. 
They're near the exit of the bar with the people from her group, and I ask her friends what her deal was, telling them about what had just happened. And it turns out, she wasn't their friend. They had met her that night at the sports bar before we showed up, and one of the guys said that she was acting inappropriately towards him as well, and when he told her he wasn't interested, she became really weird and kept asking him to be alone with her. When we left the bar, she was nowhere to be found, and I didn't see her again for the rest of the trip. I have no idea what her motive was or end goal was, and part of me feel like she was just some weird girl who was trying to flirt and was completely terrible at it, but there's another part of me that feels like she had other motives that might have been more sinister. I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, but Ernest also disappeared after that, and I never saw him again, so... Maybe they were colluding to rob people. If so, it wasn't very well planned. Either way, it was pretty creepy and I'm thankful that I didn't run into her again. There was recently a big hailstorm in my area that did a lot of damage to people's property. And as usual... A swarm of fly-by-night roofing companies and Mr. Fixits came crawling out of the woodwork in search of a cut of those juicy insurance checks. We lucked out, though. While most of my neighbors suffered all kinds of damage around their properties, we had little to none. I think a lot of it had to do with my solar panels and the angle in which our cars were parked. Our older car, a 2005 VW Jetta, did have a few little dents, but nothing worth getting upset about, and I couldn't see a single mark on my truck. When you compare this to my neighbors on the side street, many whose cars were so bad that they were written off as totaled, I can't think of any other reason. When it comes to our roof, it only had been a couple of years since ours was completely replaced. After battling the insurance company for a long time, I submitted a claim again and it was finally approved. Then maybe six months passed before we purchased the panels, which cover close to 85% of the roof itself. I doubt the shingles had even had a chance to settle yet, a process that usually occurs in the heat of the summer. Clearly, we're not in need of any repairs around my home, but this hasn't stopped the dime store repairmen from harassing us constantly. In the span of a week, probably six different individuals and companies came to my door. I was nice at first. I simply told them my roof was new and I didn't need their services. Most of them got the hint and went away, maybe leaving their car behind, but... A few tried to convince me that I was wrong. This kind of behavior is what gets on my nerves. When I pointed out that the roof couldn't be damaged without also harming the panels too, they realized what kind of person they were dealing with, and this put an end to the visitors. No one was tricking me, or so I thought then. The man who would prove me wrong showed up two or three days after the storm. I just happened to be out, and when I returned, I found a business card and a flyer stuck in my screen door. Although the name on the card was not familiar to me, I noticed that he represented my own insurer. I wondered why they would send a rep to speak to me. They had to have known that they just paid for a roof not that long ago. I briefly thought about calling, but it didn't seem worth the effort. I just mentioned it to the guy if he ever came back. And this is about the time the scammers began showing up. The next few days were a constant flood of cowboys and independent contractors knocking on my door. I got really annoyed of the chaos pretty quick, so when the insurance rep returned the next week, I wasn't as kind as I should have been. In spite of this, he was understanding and thanked me for the information, and with that I assumed that all of this was settled. Another few days went by, and I ran into a neighbor while walking my dog. We got into a discussion, and he joked about me changing my mind. I ignored it at first. This neighbor isn't exactly a genius, but... My instincts told me that there was more to it. I asked him to clarify his meaning and he told me that he had seen a man with a ladder and clipboard around my property and spoken to him earlier in the day. His description of the man sounded very similar to this insurance rep and this made me furious seeing as he knew the situation and had no reason to be there, especially while I was at work. I cut the walk short and returned home. He owed me an explanation and I wanted it right then. I called the number on the card and was connected to the main operator. When I asked to speak to him, she hesitated a moment before transferring me. After briefly being on hold, a female voice came on and asked me again who I wanted to talk to. 
I told her the rep's name, and she informed me that the man had retired and was no longer with the company. I assumed that she'd misheard me, so I spelled the man's name out to make sure that she hadn't, and she was adamant. He had retired over a year ago and could no longer help me, but if I needed assistance, she could help me instead. None of this made any sense. I was getting frustrated. Why was I being lied to? I told her everything that had occurred. The card, him showing up without notifying me, everything. And she apologized for all of the issues that I was having, but swore that she knew for a fact that he had not been at my home. I was losing my cool now. It sounded like she was calling me a liar, and I demanded that she take it back. I was prepared to cancel my policy if she didn't, and she assured me that that was not her intention, and I could hear the reluctance in her voice and began to sense something strange was really going on. I prodded, I pushed, until she gave in and just told me. As it turned out, the man on the card could not have been at my house. Not only had he retired almost two years ago, but he had been forced to do so because he had some terminal illness that had killed him not long after. Even after hearing all of this, I had a hard time accepting it. I foolishly asked for proof, and this is when she raised her voice. He and her had been close friends, I guess, since she had attended the funeral. I could hear her begin to sniffle and realize that, okay, maybe I'd gone too far, and I apologized and explained my level of confusion and concern. After speaking a little while longer, we concluded that it had been a man posing as an employee, possibly to appear more professional. He had probably received some cards from the rep in the past, and now that I had finally cooled off, the entire situation was clear to me. He had used the information gleaned from a seemingly casual conversation to plan a break-in of my home. I had given him all types of information, including when I worked. He must have been in the course of robbery, but was scared off by the sight of my neighbor. I never thought that I'd be grateful to anyone for being so nosy, but it appeared to have benefited me in this case. All of this is just conjecture, of course. Without any proof of forced entry or the like, it's gonna have to do. But looking back, I feel stupid for being so trusting of some random stranger. He must have known that the card would work on some idiot, and I happen to be that exact idiot. It also explains why he was so forgiving of my brashness. In light of what occurred, I no longer speak to strangers coming to my door, for obvious reasons. I encourage anyone reading this, should they be so unfortunate to have severe weather in their area, be very wary of the people it attracts. I thought that I was wise to all the tricks, but they proved me wrong. If you didn't contact anyone to come to your home, they shouldn't be trusted. There are a lot of underhanded people out there and their numbers will only grow as the economy continues to take some downturn. Make a plan and follow it, otherwise you may not be as lucky as I was. Back in 2016, my first husband and I decided to part ways and I found myself homeless as a result. Now with only my check to rely on, anywhere I chose would be a major step down. And while I searched, I stayed in a budget motel. This was a huge culture shock itself and motivated me to find an apartment as soon as I could. Any free time that I had was spent searching and my determination actually soon paid off. Less than two weeks passed and I found an old efficiency near downtown. There was no application or deposit. I simply paid first and last month's rent and moved in. Considering that I had little more than clothes, this process didn't take long. The location wasn't ideal, but I figured it couldn't be too bad. The area had a low crime rate, or at least that's what the manager said, and even if he was lying, I was too relieved to care. Well, as you can probably guess, I wasn't moved in a week before my car was broken into. Not soon after, the family across from me was robbed while they were out. Crimes such as burglary became common around the complex. About two months went by until it was my turn. I really didn't have much to steal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I had been violated. My sleep was repeatedly interrupted by nightmares of men with guns and face masks, and the lack of rest affected my daily life so much that I almost had several car accidents, if you can believe that. After making a giant mistake at work, I was finally forced to admit that something had to be done. 
Once the unit manager agreed to let me out of my lease, I began searching for a new place immediately. During this period, the burglaries continued, and it became such a common occurrence the police stopped coming out to investigate. Every night I had to remain in that place was a test of my courage and sanity. I was even more motivated than before to find a new apartment, but when I did, I was almost declined because of the price. In the end, I realized that I had to pay more if I wanted security and took it. My new complex was more like what I'd grown up in. There was a gate with a code and everyone was friendly, and I felt so much better after moving in. I must have slept like 13 hours the first night. Things were going so well, I was afraid something bad was going to happen and that would mess it all up. But nothing did though, and I was finally able to get settled in. I was moved in maybe a month when I met my first neighbor. She and I began talking at the mailboxes, and before I knew it, I'd been invited to a BBQ. And in spite of some lingering feelings of fear that I picked up at the last place, I took a chance and accepted the offer. And I'm glad I did. This would be the event at which I met my current husband, Brad. He told me later that he thought I was a snob because I didn't speak to him, but he understood after I shared what I had experienced in my previous apartment. It ended well, so I don't hold it against him. And truthfully, I probably was a bit of a smarty pants back then. My opinion of myself was still inflated from the way I was raised. And this story isn't about my love life, though. Instead, I'd rather tell you about a man that we'll call the man without a name. I saw him almost every day for a month, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one. I checked my mail every day after work and would see him doing the same thing, or so I thought at the time. My curiosity soon got the best of me though, and I tried to strike up a conversation. He was always just too fast. After talking to a few of my neighbors, I discovered that they had similar situations. Other than one woman's young son, nobody had ever exchanged a single word with him. Nobody even knew his name. The boy asked would the strange guy just change the subject and then rushed off to his apartment, seemingly. The location of his apartment was about all we knew. The people that lived around him said that they rarely saw or heard him, and he really was an enigma to everyone in the complex, and any shred of information that became available spread like wildfire from resident to resident. One lady was so desperate that she threw herself at him only to be rejected. The entire saga took on a whole new angle when the man without a name disappeared all of a sudden. All sorts of theories and ideas were proposed, but none could actually be proven, obviously. We'd almost forgotten about him when the truth came out, and it was far crazier than any of us expected. A month had gone by, and I was coming back from the mailbox when one of my neighbors stopped me and told me that the man had been arrested. I asked her why, and she wouldn't tell me. All she would say was to check the paper. I returned to my apartment and pulled out the local newspaper up on my computer and you'll never guess what had happened according to the article. The police got a call from our complex that a then unidentified man had been squatting in one of our abandoned units. The squatter was taken into custody with no resistance. When the officers searched the unit, over $5,000 in stolen items were discovered inside. The items ranged from cell phones to laptops. More of the story was being released in the coming weeks, under the terms of a plea bargain agreement, the man admitted burglarizing nearly a hundred apartments and homes across the city. One of the apartment complex he admitted to targeting was the place that I had fled from a few months prior. And my mind was blown. The odds had to have been astronomical. It appears as if the only place that he hadn't robbed had been the complex that he was actually squatting at. I can only guess that he thought it would bring too much attention to him. And little did he know... His attempt at lying low was what made him stand out. The only thing I ever heard was how he was able to stay in the unit so long without being noticed. I have a few theories, but it's not important enough to include them here. And to this day, that remains the single most creepy and astounding time of my life. I'm a 19 year old male currently about to finish my first year at Rice University. Until just recently, my father served in the United States Army. Our family had to move around a lot as a result, and when I reached my teens, 
My mother got tired of shuffling from base to base, and we set down roots for the first time. My dad was deployed for much of this time, and I only saw him here and there. Mom and I found a small two-bedroom house in Virginia and got a little mutt from the pound. I was finally able to live like a regular kid and make friends whose parents weren't soldiers. Our neighbors were very friendly and often had neighborhood cookouts on summer holidays. And I kissed my first girl at a July 4th party and met my best friend on my first day of school. It was the life I'd always dreamt of and although it was a relatively short time, I enjoyed every minute. Despite all of the things my mother had done wrong in my life, that one decision makes up for almost all of it. I bring up my rocky relationship with my mother only to lead into the point of this post. We had been living in the house a year when I noticed a man and a young boy had began walking by every day. This went on for over a month before I brought it up to my mother. I was honestly just curious if she knew anything about the pair. Rather than say no, she gave me a lengthy speech about minding my own business. I kept my mouth shut after that. Even when we'd see the two around town, I wouldn't say anything. My mom tried bringing them up once, but when I failed to take the bait, she never mentioned them again either. Usually, whenever we saw them, they were standing around the same busy intersection, seemingly begging for money. The man held up a sign that said, Disabled vet, can't work, me and son need your help, any donations accepted. The man would stand by a signal pole while the boy went from car to car with a coffee can. I felt bad at first, but... I soon discovered the truth. It was a wet fall evening when my mom and I were leaving Walmart. The lot was so full when we arrived and we had to park around the back of the store. I was helping load bags into the back seat when I noticed the man and boy run up to an almost new Dodge truck and get inside. I did a double take just to make sure. It seemed strange that they were begging for change but driving a nicer car than my family had. I realized that there may have been circumstances that I wasn't aware of, and boy were there. But something about it rubbed me wrong. As time went by, I'd see the pair around town, but only saw that truck twice. The second time was where the story began to get scary. This occurred a few months later while my mom was working overnight. Like always, she told me to stay home and not open the door for anyone, and like most teenagers, I ignored her and did what I wanted. On this night, I was skating with a few friends at a drive through bank. It was around midnight when a familiar truck pulled up nearby. The man asked if we wanted to go to a party. It was supposedly the boy's birthday, and he wanted some kids his age to celebrate with. Everyone declined the offer, even after he'd mentioned that there would be party favors available. They offered once more before driving off and everything about the situation seemed strange, and I must not have been the only one who felt it. Only later would I discover how wise our choice had been. 2019 soon became 2020, and with the new year, as you remember, some crazy stuff happened. I'd continue to see the two guys walking down my street and begging at the intersection until one day they just sort of disappeared. I took note of it but figured that they had moved on just as my family had done so many other times. It was a lifestyle and I was very familiar with it. Lockdown would soon come and my focus would shift on to other things. My dad would soon come home for a while and I'd spend all my time with him. It wasn't until well after the lockdowns had ended that the two strangers came back to my attention. I was browsing through Twitter when I saw a picture of a man connected to a headline. I clicked on the link and got the shock of my life. According to the article, the young man, name withheld because he was a minor, had showed up at our local police station and shared an amazing story. At first, the officers didn't believe him, but after a bit of research, they were eager to hear more. A few years prior to their arrival to our town, the adult male, I'm not sharing his name, that scumbag deserves to be forgotten, had abducted the young man from a bus station in St. Louis. Over the course of several months, the man abused the boy until he grew tired of him, and rather than dispose of him, he began to use the boy to lure other young men into his trap. The pair would travel from city to city, begging during the day and trolling for prey at night. The boy estimated that the man had violated roughly 25 to 30 other boys during his time traveling with him. 
he was adamant that he never took part in any of the actual acts. His purpose was solely to bait the young men to the truck. And although many of the young men were released alive, the boys said that he was almost positive a few were not so lucky. In one case, he said that the old man had blood on his clothes after dumping one young man off alongside the highway. And when he asked about the blood, the old man grew aggressive so he didn't press the matter. However, without witnessing any of this firsthand, he couldn't provide any names or locations. And this dark way of life carried on until mid-2020 when the old man had actually contracted COVID and died. With nowhere to go, the boy figured that he'd just tell his story in hopes that someone may help him find his family. At the time of the story it was written, the investigation was still in its early phases and I'm not sure how much more had been discovered since. If I find out anything more during the summer break, I'll post an update. The article put me in a state of shock for many days after I read it. I had been suspicious of the two from the get-go, but realizing how close I had been to being assaulted and possibly dead was just too much to handle. I briefly thought about sharing the story with my mom, but quickly changed my mind. Considering her behavior from the outset and that I had gone out against her wishes, it didn't seem smart. And as far as I'm aware, she still doesn't know anything about it. It wouldn't be out of the ordinary for her to miss something so major. She's always been very focused on herself at the cost of everyone around her. And really, that's all I know for now. There was no information about what became of the boy, and he'd probably be an adult by now. And for all I know, he could be a fellow student at my school, or maybe even yours. There's also the chance that he took up his companion's habits, too. They say most of those who abuse were abused themselves. Somewhere tonight there may be a young man stalking the streets looking for his next victim. And if anyone reading this has a young teen son, it might be a good idea to share this story with them. It could save his innocence and more importantly, maybe his life. Ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a nurse, and when the time came, my parents paid for me to attend the nursing program at my nearby junior college. My last year of high school should have been a sign of what was to come, and despite all of my hard work, it just really wasn't to be. I managed to complete the first year, but my grades were so bad that I wasn't allowed to re-enroll for my second year. My parents were disappointed to hear this, but no one was as sad as I was. I felt like a failure for a long time. After a few months, I pulled myself together and began planning my next move. For the moment, I had no real clear path with my life, but I was certain of one thing. Above anything else, my parents deserved to be paid back. They naturally insisted that it wasn't necessary, but I made up my mind already and nobody was going to change it. And But without a job, this was just not going to be possible, and therefore I began the search the following day. It wasn't long until I was hired at a small diner downtown. I never waited tables in my life, but it was a paying job, and that was all that really mattered to me at that moment. I took my new job rather quickly. It wasn't as difficult as I really expected. The shorthand was the hardest part, but once I'd learned it, everything else was pretty much gravy. I'd been at the diner about three months when this guy, John, first came in for lunch. John, quote-unquote, is he asked that I call him was this older guy. He was thin and wiry and always wore a cap with a cross on it. That first Sunday, he just so happened to be seated in my area, and from there on, he made it a point to always be seated where I was working. I could tell that he was special from the start. I felt unusually comfortable speaking to him. We'd exchanged names before I even had a chance to get his coffee. It was like I was speaking to a family member and despite his reserved manner, he was very honest about his life and the mistakes he'd made. On one of those Sundays, I mentioned his tattoos and he proceeded to tell me all about them. I was shocked when he said that he'd served 20 years in prison earlier in his life. My perception of what a criminal looked like changed greatly after meeting him. His teens and early 20s were chaotic and his abuse of alcohol and drugs led him into a life of crime. One day he found himself neck deep in a plot to actually rob a bank. The robbery did not go well, obviously, and after a member of the public was injured, he had to go on the run. 
He was eventually caught and his reluctance to name the rest of the gang meant that he was given the maximum penalty. And after serving the majority of his sentence, he was released, I guess, in the early 2000s. But since that time, he had been keeping his nose completely clean, and most of his life was now spent between work and church, and he had just left services that Sunday when he first dropped into the diner. If I was a religious person, I might think that we were destined to meet. It was during one of his other Sunday visits where my reason for waiting tables was brought up. John asked why a girl as intelligent as me was serving food. I told him about my dreams of becoming a nurse and my failed attempt at school. He talked about regrets and failures in his life. On his way out that day, he urged me to give it a second try at school before I got too old. In his mind, all I needed was a little life experience and I'd do better the next time. I knew that he was just being nice for my sake, but I'll admit that his energy was very motivating. I thought my dream was in the past, but hearing his encouraging words proved me wrong. Psyched up or not, that phase of life was going to have to wait until I paid my parents back. And for the present, work was my focus, and I, I continued working every shift available and every Sunday, John and I would grow more familiar with each other. This lasted for roughly three months until we stopped showing up. I guess that he was sick or busy or something and figured that he'd come back the next Sunday, but when that next Sunday arrived and he was nowhere to be seen. After three weeks of no-shows, I just gave up hope. It was a sad day when I realized that he wasn't coming back. He'd kind of become a father figure to me in that brief time and his encouraging words had lifted me from the hole of disappointment that I'd been in for the past year. Unfortunately, life is a series of meetings and goodbyes, I guess. I picked myself up and just carried on with my work. Soon, I'd all but forgotten about this John guy, and five months passed and one afternoon I was doing something in the back when the head cook said someone wanted to speak to me. I walked out and saw a middle-aged man standing by the cash register. He introduced himself as a police officer from our local department. When I asked what he wanted, he handed me this manila envelope with my name written on it. He proceeded to tell me that John had left it behind for me. I was naturally confused and asked what it was. He couldn't tell me, and I was beginning to get annoyed with him. When I started to press him for it, he made it clear that he couldn't say anything else other than that John was dead. I'd suspected that this may have actually been the case, but hearing it out loud started to really hurt a lot. I didn't have the heart to go on after that, and I just simply thanked the detective, and he left. With the envelope in my hand, I went back to open it. I now wish that I never had. Inside was a stack of money with a bank band wrapped around it, and my mouth grew drier as I counted it. I recounted it several times and came up with the same amount, $10,000. Along with the cash, a note was included and it read, If you're reading this, I'm dead. I'd wanted to give it to you myself, but my old life caught up with me. Take this and pay your parents what you owe them. Use the rest to go back to school. You're too smart to be waiting tables at some greasy spoon. Life is too short to have regrets. Good luck and don't give up on your dreams. You got this. At the bottom of the page was his full signature, a name I'd never gotten the chance to learn, and there was a ton of emotions flowing through me in that moment. His faith in me was touching beyond belief, far more than I ever had in myself. My mind drifted from the money for a brief time, but a sick feeling quickly came rushing through me a moment later. What was all this? Where had John gotten all this money from? He was some ex-con who drove a 20-year-old truck and painted houses for a living. I read back through his note and a chilling line got my attention. My old life caught up with me. What did he mean by this? Did he rob a bank or steal it from somewhere else? My heart began pounding out of my chest and I'm terrified that somebody may be looking for this money and it leads them to me. I've also considered the possibility that it's all a setup by the police and maybe they think I was part of the theft and are waiting for me to do something else. I'm not a criminal. I don't know how these types of things work. It's been two weeks since I got the envelope and I still have no idea what to do with it. I still go to work every day like normal but... I'm always looking around for something to happen. I hate to involve other people in this, but 
I think I need advice from you guys. What do you think I should do? The money would solve all of my problems and set me up for the future, but I can't shake the feeling that something bad's gonna happen. Let me know what you think, and I could really use all the help that I can get. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, and I'd love to see you this coming Sunday, as it's my birthday, and we get a little wild. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always kiss your centipede.